this is new for you guys, but it's a very interesting subject, so I think you'll enjoy it. Um, when it is done, I need to talk to you guys a little bit about some mechanics, so don't just rush out, okay? Okay. Good. Okay. Well, hi, and uh, welcome to the, uh, what, last week of um, your uh, shortened semester. Yay! Uh, <laughs> <laughs> So, um, be because uh, in the summer things really go by quickly, there have been a number of things that have been kind of abbreviated, and one of them is um, this issue of scholarly communication. Uh, you've talked about interpersonal communication and mass communication and uh, uh, designist communication at sort of various points in the class. But especially for information library science, it's, it's very important for us to consider the notion of what we might call scholarly communication, because this is sort of the stuff we deal with, uh, and in, in libraries in particular. So um, uh, we'll start with that, but pretty quickly move to some applications of this in the area of, uh, that I'll call scholarly impact. So uh, to begin, um, the, the products of scholarly communication are those things that we put in our libraries. Uh, they're the things we put on our shelves. Uh, they're either the individual objects or they're the collections of things that we manage. And so a good amount of what goes on in, uh, in the information profession deals with the products of some sort of, of scholarly uh, or, in some cases, popular communication. But we're more interested in the scholarly communication part. <clears throat> There's a, a, a field or fields, uh, and, it, and it goes by lots of different names, uh, bibliometrics, uh, Infometrics, and more recently, there's uh, something called webometrics. Uh, but they all basically are, are derived from uh, research in the pre and post World War II period that related to communication theory and what was then called documentation science. Science. So uh, the Journal of Documentation is well known to you. Uh, it's now called the Journal of the American Society for Information Science and Technology, but in the early days, it was known as the Journal of Documentation. Uh, 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 actually, sorry, there, there was a different journal of documentation, but this, this was the sort of the terminology that um, um, people were using back in, in those days. And it grew out of um, work um, uh, that were, was being done by library scientists, by uh, operation researchers, who were having to deal with really large collections of information, uh, mainly for the war effort. Uh, uh, and so, uh, in some respects, this is one of the original contributions of our field. So most of the time we're borrowers and importers from other fields for theory. But this is something that actually I think we can uh, have some, uh, some claim to. One of the core concepts uh, uh, or pieces of this bibliometrics or metrics is citation analysis. And so that's where we're going to start today. Um, just to sort of show you that you know this is um, uh, by, taken by some to be a field here. Here's a book um, called An Introduction to Infometrics that uh, is uh, probably about 15 years old now. But I'll just pass it around. You can see some of the, the things that people are concerned with. Um, one of the things that um, uh, librarians have long had to deal with are just really simple things like how many people do you need to put on the reference desk to handle a certain population. Uh, a service population. Well, queuing theory out of operative search is one way to address that problem. McDonald's has the same problem. How many people do you got to get on registers at different points of the day? I, this is, you, you know, you don't just randomly do this. Uh, you can you have uh, techniques, uh, mathematical techniques for computing these things. So it's, these are things that have been around in library science for a very, very long time. Uh, the, the notion of citation analysis is not only um, uh, sort of very important nowadays for scholarly productivity, but in some people's minds, it's actually uh, taken on a life of its own and is uh, being sort of abused. So we can you know, get to some of that uh, in, in a bit. Um, so on the one hand, we might have these metrics that are kind of run amok, um, and um, uh, there's many, many kinds of augmentations that people are thinking about uh, one of which, uh, uh, or a couple of which, I'll, I'll, I'll share with you today. So, uh, here's the basic premise of citation analysis, a set of logical uh, assumptions that's pretty hard to argue with. 
um, a citation. That is, somebody who says, uh, this paper uh, is related to this idea in my paper, and you get the reference uh, at the end of the paper and in the paper, is uh, a kind of relationship, right? Is, does anyone disagree with that? I hope not. Um, so the first thing we can say is if a paper cites something, it's more likely that those two papers are related than some arbitrary paper that's not cited. Now, it doesn't mean that there aren't other papers that aren't related, but this is in, in, uh, some evidence, some probabilistic evidence of relationship. Agree? Anyone want to disagree with that one? Okay, good. <laughs> um, in likewise, the corollary here is that if some other paper, some ar if you just randomly pick some paper from the, the, the inf information space out there and we grab it, it's more likely that something cited is related to that uh, 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 citing paper than this arbitrarily grabbed one. Okay, just kind of a corollary of this uh, first uh, principle. Now here's the other uh, kind of basic logical assumption, and this is uh, the co-citation kind of argument. It says that if um, two different papers cite the same paper, then they're more likely to be related than papers that don't have any common citations in, uh, uh, together. Okay, so this is another kind of logical assumption. I mean, it sort of makes sense. Yeah, probability, it doesn't say for sure, but there's a higher probability of these two papers being related because they co-cite something else. So two papers that cite the Bible are more likely to be related than two papers that don't. Now, a lot of things cite the Bible. Or um, Das Kapital, I think, is one of the most cited things in history. And um, uh, yeah, so there's a, it, it doesn't mean that they're for sure related, but better chance that they're related than two things that don't. Okay? So these are the two kinds of underlying assumptions. Uh, and uh, Belbert Griffith and uh, Henry Small, Carl Droit, and others at, at Drexel University and at uh, the Institute for Scientific Information have for years been developing this kind of theory and practice. Uh, Eugene Garfield, who is sort of one of the pioneers and father figures of information science, uh, uh, created the Institute for Scientific Information, or ISI, and uh, has um, uh, really formalized this as a set of metrics that uh, people can use uh, for all sorts of purposes, and that's where we want to turn our attention to uh, next. Um, Linda Smith, um, uh, about 15 years ago, wrote a, a paper that tried to sort of summarize the, um, uh, the, the applications of citation analysis and some of the limitations. And uh, uh, very, uh, very often that's one of the readings that, that we would uh, do uh, in this class. Here are just a kind of a laundry list of, of some of the problems with just going through and counting citations. So the way this usually works is from the, the point of view of scholarly uh, productivity or impact is, well, let's say I write a paper. Does anybody read it is something I might be concerned with. Right? And how can you know if somebody's read it? What are some indications that people have read it? It's been checked out from the library. It's been checked out. If it's a book, yeah, you could see if it's been checked out or if it's an article, maybe if it's been in a library loan. <laughs> People cite it. You would hope that they would have read it if they're going to cite it. People criticize. People criticize it. They send you email. They write you a letter. Right? And, um, they they grab you on the street. Uh, lots of different possible sorts of uh, uh, sources of, of evidence that people have actually read your stuff and it's you know had some influence on them. Now citations are useful because they're systematic and if. In the olden days, when Garfield first started uh, ISI, they would manually collect all the journal articles and hire people like you to go through those journal articles and manually list the authors and the, where, uh, uh, of, in all of the references and create these indexes. 
Now, over time, of course, this has been auto uh, automated, uh, but um, uh, this, is, this was still a, you know, a valuable kind of service that uh, uh, ISI has been providing for many years now. The, the idea that the number of times you get cited for an article is meaningful is at the heart of citation analysis. Does that make sense to you? That if you write a paper and it gets cited by 10 other papers, that probably the impact of that paper is more than a paper that only gets cited by two other papers. Yeah, I mean, it sort of makes sense, right? Uh, the impact could be positive or negative. I mean, maybe it's uh, everybody's throwing darts at it. Exactly. Classic examples, the Fleshman and Pons papers on cold fusion. It gets cited a ton, but always for wrong. Um, well, those are local things, so um, that's not sort of automatic there. This, this would have to be something that uh, either would be manually collected by looking at the journal literature, or in, in today's world, yes, automatically co uh, co uh, collected. So um, Elsevier now uh, has what's called Scopus, which does it for all of the Elsevier as well as other journals. ISI, of course, you know, has been doing this for years and is sort of the 500-pound the, uh, gorilla in this uh, arena. Um, and um, Google Scholar is now making inroads here. So there's a lot of alternatives that are beginning to appear. Okay. Yeah. So here's some of the problems with this notion of saying, well, just counting the number of citations. You know, clearly there's some issues. Uh, you can have multiple authors. So in the early days, you know, if there were like 10 authors, usually only the first one got counted. Um, uh, that's pretty much been taken care of in the days uh, of electronic uh, records where you, you know, if you're going to get one, you can just as easily get the rest, assuming you can parse the, the uh, um, punctuation between author names. Um, self citations. So what, sh what shall we do when I cite myself? You know, and how do we take those out? Uh, probably is what we would like to do is take them out. So most citation analyses tend to take out self citations. Um, the, the sort of homographic notions, um, same name, different authors. So there are a lot of Linda Smiths. Uh, there aren't any other Gary Marchaninis. Uh, you know, when I was in high school, I hated that name. Uh, but um, yeah, now in the internet world, that's actually pretty neat to have a, a, a really kind of unique name, at least in the United States. So um, this notion of same name, uh, different authors. This uh, this also sort of um, there's kind of a parallel with um, uh, people who change their names. Um, and they, where this gets um, a, a little bit problematic, especially if you know you've. You've had a, a fairly robust publishing career, and then you change your name. Now you've sort of got to somehow make those connections, and that's hard. Um, various kinds of synonymic um, uh, events that happen with name variations, hyphenations, how people sort of handle um, um, Ds and, and, and other kinds of uh, uh, prefixes. Um, the, the actual types of source People who are going to build these indexes have to make decisions. Am I only going to do to uh, index books? Am I only going to index journals? If so, which journals? And so ISI has humanities indexes and social science indexes and science indexes and of course the merge index and the web of science. And but they don't index every single journal. So if you're publishing in re, in, a, in a relatively obscure area, you might get missed. In fact, this has been a problem with folks uh, in sort of the, the archival area. I, I, I still don't believe the, um, um, the uh, American um, Ar Archivist Journal is called? They're not online. They're, they're still not being indexed. Uh, you know, it's a major uh, vehicle for people who to write in the archives area. So uh, this, this is a, a problematic in terms of types of sources. Um, then, of course, there's the more subtle things like, well, people talk about this in the paper, but they don't actually cite it. <laughs> the well-known, you know, Einstein effect. Well, you know, you know are you going to have to go out and you know, cite one of his papers? Um, there's also fluctuations over time. I mean, you know, if, if you want to look at your impact one year out, too bad. Because, you know, it takes a long time for, first of all, the paper to get published. 
Then, once the paper's out, it takes it a while for people to read it, and then for them to decide to cite it, and then for their papers to get out. So there's this in, just inherent time lag there that uh, um, is, is uh, at play. So basically, uh, you know, it pays to be a little older, I guess. Um, there's also um, variations across the fields. Humanities tends to be relatively um, sort of single author, and, you know, the, 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 the individual working on a, on a problem. Um, whereas uh, if you go to the social sciences, it's somewhere in the middle. And if you go to, say, the biomedical uh, sciences, you know, you've got these uh, lists of 20 authors uh, on, on papers. And so it really changes the nature of, of what those citation numbers mean. So if you're working in, in, bio, in a biomedical area and you've only got like five citations to all of your papers over your first 10 years, you're not really very, having much impact. Um, or, uh, whereas that could mean a lot if you know, you've written three books as a humanities scholar or a single author. Yeah. Um, you may have said this earlier, talking about citation analysis, but I mean, what truly, how is, how is citation analysis used? I mean, uh, for academics, are you rated purely on your? Okay. <laughs> Great. Lean into the next slide. Give me the money. Yeah. Then. Yeah. Right. Uh, so there's one other thing under there. There's also errors that that occur in the databases. So um, those are some of the problems with it. Nonetheless, there are a whole lot of applications of of citation analysis. So first of all, uh, it is the the use of, of this for scholarly productivity. Some universities actually uh, require people when they go for promotion or tenure to provide their citation uh, analysis. So how many of your papers have been cited and how many times? And um, this gets used increasingly by granting agencies for making important decisions about funding. Uh, it, it, it seems to be much more prevalent uh, in uh, Europe right now. Uh, I've, I've just done a couple of uh, reviews for um, promotion cases of people in, in UK universities, and I was kind of surprised to see that for every publication on the entire Vita, they provided the number of citations. And the citation, uh, the, the impact factor for the journal. So, and we'll get to impact factor in a minute. I mean, this, this is pretty, it's pretty arduous to actually first get the data, but then also to sort of be required to provide this as a, as a, a source of, of sort of evidence of your impact. So for scholarly productivity, this, this is actually relatively important. Um, some universities um, uh, don't require it. Um, I think most of the faculty here, when they make their, their tenure case, uh, tend to actually do a citation analysis. Um, uh, and not that it's required, and, and, and it sort of you know helps people to see uh, that uh, uh, you know people are at least reading your stuff and citing it, um, which uh, is is a you know, some, somewhat meaningful. Now, does it tell the whole story? Of course not. Um, now, there's lots of other reasons to do citation analysis. Uh, you can you can look at at sort of different literatures uh, and relationships among fields. So what are the citation patterns across different uh, disciplines or subdisciplines? Kind of a classic paper was done by uh, Christine Borgman and colleagues um, a few years ago in the field of communications. So you would think, what is communications? Well, it turns out that in communications, there's these mass communication subdisciplines, and there's the interpersonal communication subdisciplines. And they each have their own journals. And they did an analysis of the overlaps of cit citations across these two subdisciplines. Basically, they don't cite one another. <laughs> right? So even within a field, pretty big field, but still a field, within the subdisciplines, we're not getting much overlap. Now, what's happening today, though, in fields like bioinformatics or interdisciplinary emergent fields, you're starting to see all sorts of this cross-pollination. So as I was reviewing a bunch of proposals this weekend, uh, uh, in the biomedical area, uh, it was just as common to see computer science journals as it was um, medical journals uh, or biology journals within the same uh, proposal being cited, because these things all kind of begin to tie together. 
So you can use the citation patterns to begin to look at uh, what um, um, Henry Small and others have called these research trends and begin to perhaps see what are the sort of um, um, the kinds of interdisciplinary uh, programs that are, or, or, or disciplines that are starting to emerge. So if you had done this like th uh, 50 years ago for biochemistry, you may have pre predicted that biology and chemistry had a lot in common. We're starting to uh, sort of see uh, cross, uh, cross citation patterns. Um, now you can also look at this from sort of a user study point of view of library impact. Uh, the the um, um, the, the fact that people are actually using the resources that are checked out of your library, whether it be uh, articles uh, or uh, books, uh, easier here, then you can start to actually understand your impact as a, as a library. Um, there are lots of historical studies that can be done. You can begin to look at an individual person and their career or the relationship among people who had mutual influence on one another via uh, citation patterns, or even not of people, but of ideas. How did the idea of X sort of come about? Where were the roots of it? How did these things uh, cross-pollinate? People, you know, sort of classically look at, say, you know, Leibniz and Newton sort of independently inventing the calculus. Well, you know, I don't think they were that independent. You know, there were there were there were a lot of people writing letters to one another in those days, uh, and. Uh, uh, there's clearly some sort of zeitgeist uh, there that uh, uh, led to uh, these, uh, these developments. Um, the, the notion of communication patterns, just how do ideas spread? And it can be traced through citation uh, uh, patterns. It's another kind of theoretical kind of study. Now, now we get to some really practical and, and in fact, today, really important stuff. Uh, let me do this one first, and then we'll come back to that. The collection development to one is very practical in sort of a library setting. Um, when I was at University of Maryland, there was a very clever librarian there who was having trouble with the uh, chemistry department. Chem uh, we, were, we had to cancel some serials, right? Or budget uh, um, you know, cuts and so on. And so what do you, what do you cancel? Very expensive things. And so all the departments would you know, have their debates. OK, we'll give up this and this. Chemistry, which had their own libraries, no, we use everything. We cannot cancel anything. And they're, you know, they're an important department, and so she was having a hard time trying to uh, convince them they should cancel anything. So she did a very clever thing. She went in, and she looked at all of the faculty publications and where they published and what they cited. And she was able to come up with a whole list of journals that they never used, they never published in, and they never cited in, and brought it to them as evidence, and what could they do? Uh, so she sort of uh, made her argument with real empirical data, and because they claimed to be scientists, they couldn't resist the empirical data. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, so you know, here's a practical sort of, of a collection development uh, or weeding uh, sort of um, uh, example of, of um, uh, citation analysis. Now, the two biggies, though, that are really happening in today's world are most of our retrieval engines today really deal with citations because if you think a link is a citation a hyperlink is a citation right a link from one page to another is a citation it's a relationship that the author has established and so the number of in links coming to your web page are really really powerful indicators of importance so if you have a lot of people linking to you then you're you know, that's an important uh, website or web page now, it's even more important if a lot of the people who are linking to you have a lot of people linking to them or have a lot of outlinks that are themselves important. So these kinds of recursive algorithms, PageRank and Clever uh, uh, are, are, are two well-known ones. This is what basically Google and the other search engines depend upon today. So, you know, Yahoo had a different model three, five years ago, right? They were hiring a bunch of librarians to do, to, to do manual indexing. They lost in the marketplace because this stuff actually worked pretty well. And if you think about it, it makes sense. Um, the fact that one indexer, professional indexer, has said this document, this web page, is about this and, and assigned these words or, or these topics is some evidence and it's you know something valuable. The words the author uses 
is also another set of evidence and, and of some value. But the fact that 30 different people out there all point to this with some kind of common element is quite powerful. And in fact, what we know from retrieval studies is that the most important, well, one of the most important sources of evidence is the anchor text in the incoming links. So the actual highlighted words that somebody clicks on that lead you to a page, really, really valuable as an indexing, uh, uh, an indexer for that target page. And in fact, if you get all the anchor text from say 30 or 40 pages pointing to you, that's a, that's a really powerful summary of the meaning or the content of, of that uh, target page. Um, so this is this this stuff that sort of we started and we created, you know, 50 years ago is now big time multi billion dollar industry. Now there's another kind of application that also has a multi billion dollar industry type of implications, and that's recommender systems. So when you think about it, what happens when you go to Amazon? and you buy this book, and then you get these things, well, you know, other people who have bought this book have bought this other book. So that's a kind of an implicit recommendation that's made by computing all of these kinds of links. In this case, the link is not a hyperlink, but a what? A purchase, a sale, right? I mean, so the, the, the citation, if you will, is I bought it. That's a pretty powerful indicator pertinence, right? Somebody actually put down some dollars for this. That's, that's, that's pretty useful. Um, the other way you can, uh, a, a kind of a recommendation are the explicit links that people actually rate. But the implicit links are these kinds of citation analysis like evidences that people are, are building in um, uh, these recommender systems based upon. So there's a lot of practical applications of citation analysis. It's big business as well as good theory. Now, there are a bunch of tools out there, ISI, the Institute for Scientific Information, and the Web of Science being sort of the classic uh, example. And if I can, um, you know, just for a second, and um, you know, I'm sure you've all seen it's this. No? Use this, right? Okay, good. People are shaking their heads. You can go, as long as you're on campus uh, or you're proxied in um, through the library, you have access to this enormous resource that companies pay lots and lots of money to, to have access to. We pay lots and lots of money to have access to it uh, through the library. And here you can actually do topical searches or you can do um, uh, term searches. Um, well, this is always dangerous, but um, um, let's. Um, Let's try something here. Um, let's do a um, cited search. Yeah, yeah, okay, I'll accept that. And let's take an author. My, uh, pre, my uh, good friend and colleague, Ben Schneiderman, for example. I'm just going to type in Schneiderman and do a search. And I'm searching, I haven't uh, limited this, this is across everything. And now we're going to, it's going to go out there and do its magic. And it's going to come back with the various citations to at least, not just Ben Schneiderman, but all the Schneidermans. Uh, he clearly is going to dominate here. But, um, you know, notice there's some Schneidermans that are not Ben. Okay? Um, but lots and lots of, so here's his book that probably gets cited you know, hundreds and hundreds of times. And this is pretty tedious stuff. So here's something that's been cited 137 times. That's a different schleiner. Uh, I guess we gotta go to another page. Um, doing this with this interface is, uh, a little bit painful. And so what most people who do citation analysis do is they'll use uh, the sort of either dialog or some service to actually pose very specific kinds of batch queries and get the results back so you can harvest them better. Uh, Lachman Miho, one of our former doctoral students here, is now a professor in the uh, University of Indiana, is a master at this. 
and uh, he's been conducting all sorts of uh, interesting studies over the years. So we can see, you know, here's a paper that's been cited 32 times. But it's a little weird because you see here it's been cited seven times. Some little variant in either the name or the title or the journal name is, is what causes these sorts of effects. All right, so uh, back to um, tools. Uh, another kind of tool uh, that um, uh, emerged uh, about 10 years ago is called CiteSeer originally, a research index. This was really mainly for the computer science literature, but it was all done automatically on the web. And so you can go in and, and uh, find a citation, and it'll give you all of the citations to it, and you can actually click on them, and usually because it's on the web, you can actually get to those articles. So basically it gives you a way, unlike ISI, which now you're still kind of stuck with going to the library or finding this online through the, the library catalog, what the, this, uh, the research index does is it pretty quickly allows you to actually jump to the articles in most cases. So you get to go not only from the index, but to the primary resource. This is the trend. This is where we're going. It's going to be that way for everything uh, pretty, pretty uh, soon. Uh, there's another uh, famous uh, one from out of Germany, the DBL uh, um, uh, bibliography that does a similar thing. Google Scholar is kind of the new emergent uh, player here in terms of being able to um, um, We can do something uh, similar here. And as soon as I type in Shireman, I'm going to get um, a bunch of the, his publications. And then, you know, this book has been cited almost 3,000 times. At least the Google Scholar knows about. Now, that doesn't mean it's been, that's the only citations, but that's a lot of citations. So this is the way Google <coughs> Scholar is handling this. One of the assignments that you didn't have an opportunity to do, given the shortened summer session, is a citation analysis uh, in which you actually went in and used ISI and Google Scholar to do some um, a citation analysis of an article of your choice and look at some of the differences. You see they're, they're not parallel. You're not going to get the exactly the same results. We used to include Scopus as well, but the university has now, um, I think, uh, stopped its subscription to uh, Scopus. Um, there's um, another kind of um, interesting way to think about uh, some of this. Uh, here's an atlas of cyberspaces. People over, over, over time have tried to use this notion of citation analysis or links <clears throat> to map things. And so these are all sorts of maps of different kinds of uh, info spaces. And you'll see just great kinds of um, uh, visualizations. Um, uh, so, you know, this, this was uh, work at MIT, People Garden. Uh, this was actually an early social networking kind of analysis in terms of people linking to one another. Um, you know, here's a more uh, sort of a, uh, a, 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 um, what are called uh, um, self-organizing maps uh, of, of the way different uh, topics uh, fit together. Uh, you know, here's a more classic unity relationship type map. You know, just all sorts of interesting visualizations people have, have done to, uh, here's one from Maryland uh, uh, using uh, um, this uh, hierarchical layout. Um, uh, here's a classic heat map. Heat maps are pretty popular in lots of scientific areas now to sort of show uh, trends and patterns. Uh, here's another um, uh, classic sort of Cajonan uh, feature map uh, from my former student, Charlene. Uh, here's um, you know, more uh, sort of um, cluster uh, layout type thing. Here's a 3D one, classic maps. Instead of uh, you know, putting physical geography on here, you're putting concepts on here, right? So lots of interesting ways to sort of map. Here's a nice space, and these conceptual spaces, and they're based upon this, you know, some sort of relationship, some sort of linkage. Could be a hyperlink, could be a citation. In fact, I would claim that one of the challenges of this field, and you know, one of the things that um, would be, um, you know, sort of our future, is in discovering new kinds of relationships. 
and then creating systems and services that take advantage of those kinds of relationships. All right, so back to the events here. Now, it, it's more than citation analysis that's going on here. There are lots of other kinds of, 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 of related sort of things. So I'll just name a couple here. So one is this issue of um, journal impact factor. And you probably have heard of this. Everyone wants to publish in Nature because if you publish in Nature, it's high impact. What does that mean, high impact? Well, Nature articles get cited a lot. That's all it means. I mean, that's the evidence. So the impact factor is computed by taking the previous two years of any journal, so you pick your favorite journal, and you say, I'm going to take, if this is 2007, I'm going to take 2005 and 2006, I'm going to find all of the times that articles in, in this case, Library and Information Science Research, have been cited in my entire space, this is as broad as I can make that, and I'm going to divide it by the total number of papers that were published in those two years, and that's the impact factor. So impact, uh, 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 something like nature is going to have a very, very large impact factor. Uh, I don't actually don't even know what the numbers are. The impact factors for pretty uh, um, important journals uh, can be as low as three or four, and those are probably the highest in a, in a subfield. So in computer science, four or five is huge. Uh, and, and, and so this becomes the basis for a whole cascading set of decisions, like where do I publish if I'm an assistant professor trying to have impact? Well, high impact journal, so the rich get richer. Kind of, kind of, kind of thing goes on here. And um, there is a really uh, insightful uh, article in the Chronicle of Higher Education a couple of uh, falls ago that sort of looked at this as kind of a, you know, that, that what's sort of driving science in a lot of ways are these impact factors. So people review grants, you know, big, big multi-million dollar kinds of proposals from big teams of people. They look at and see where have these things been, have these people been publishing? And if, you know, you're not publishing in the top tier journals, you're not going to get it. And so that it, it motivates people to actually continue to try to get their papers out there into those top cited places. The, the denominator is the number of articles everywhere published in the past two years? No, yeah, in that uh, number of articles in that journal that are cited. No, sorry. Yeah. Over the number of articles in that journal published. Okay. So if it's less than one, that's not very good. But most journals are actually less than one. Now there's another kind of index that has been um, uh, created and is getting popularized, the Hirsch Index or H Index. Uh, and basically this is kind of a recursive algorithm, uh, but the easiest way to uh, explain it is you, you take the number of citations of your highest cited paper uh, and then you see, have other, other papers that I've written been cited that many times? And if the answer is no, you go down, you go down, you go down, until you find the, the, um, um, the number of papers that have been cited exactly that many times, that highest number. And so in our field, an H factor of 10 is pretty darn good, very, very high. It means you have 10 papers that have been cited at least 10 times. So there aren't very many people in our field with factors above that. I don't think there's anybody in the 20s. But if you go into biomedicine, or, bi or, bi or, or uh, uh, to the biosciences, because the number of authors on a paper, and because the citation patterns are so different, you get huge H factors. H factors sometimes in the three digits. Uh, uh, you know, uh, when the, the papers might have 100, 200 citations in them. And if you've got 20 authors or 10 authors, they're all citing themselves at least. Uh, and so it, it sort of begins to build up. 
not that that's a bad thing. It's just it's very it's very dangerous to try and compare fields with the H factor. You can do it a little bit with the uh, citation uh, analysis, uh, even though there, it's, it's dangerous there. But uh, you have to be extremely careful going across fields. Uh, going across people within a field might be a fair kind of comparison. Uh, if you want more on this, the uh, Wikipedia has got a pretty nice uh, article on uh, the H index. Now. Um, here at SILS, we've um, um, sort of invented a new kind of index, and this is what I'll close with. Uh, we call it the MPACT. Uh, and, um, um, well, I guess I, I didn't uh, talk about this sort of uh, other uh, issue of multiple indexes. So, uh, Blaise Cronin and Ralph Shaw uh, a few years ago had a, a paper in which they looked at total number of citations, total number of Google hits, and Lexus and Nexus hits. And then you just got sort of three measures. And you could begin to see, you know, were people being sort of, you know, um, um, noted, if you will, in three different kinds of services. And we can imagine this getting extended uh, in other multiple ways. Our um, uh, sort of approach here is, well, there's plenty of work on, this, on these kinds of relationships for citations. Can we somehow try to take advantage of another kind of relationship? Um, Professors do more than research uh, and more than teach, uh, but the teaching part of it tends to get, is very difficult and sort of mushy to evaluate. Your student evaluation forms are, are one uh, kind of measure, but it's really hard to go across semesters, across faculty, uh, and, and in fact, um, uh, that's only sort of one aspect. You're, you, it's not quite as bad as going on ratemyprofessor.com and mining that data, but it's, um, you know, it, 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 it's, there's not a, a lot of consistency there. So I've been uh, in this sort of business for a long time, and I've, uh, I've observed a lot of uh, senior professors uh, who sort of fall into kind of maybe three or four categories. There's the people who are like very research-oriented, and uh, you know that's where they put all of their eggs. And then there's the people who are like very teaching oriented, and that's where they put all their eggs. And then the people who are sort of do this balance uh, in between. Um, I was pretty curious about the people who um, you know, really spend a lot of time mentoring students. And is there a way we can begin to actually come up with a way to sort of with a, a systematic and fair way to um, count that? So, uh, I, over the years, I've, I've uh, watched uh, dissertation committees, and um, it seemed to me that, you know, the epitome of mentoring is the dis dissertation um, experience. And, and so, the chair of a dissertation committee has a pretty intimate relationship with this person um, uh, that... Uh, uh, you know, is a lot of give and take and, uh, and usually involves a lot of time. And also people on committee member, uh, on the committees, uh, you know, maybe not quite as much time, although in some cases it might be just as much time. So what I've observed is that we have people who spend an enormous amount of time and effort working with, with uh, dissertations. And the reason I'm focused on dissertations is we can get those. Right? Uh, and uh, whereas master's papers, uh, you know, a lot of schools don't have them, or they're they're um, they're not um, uh, generally available, and certainly not student projects, uh, you know, are almost impossible to get your hands on across lots and lots of um, disciplines. Uh, uh, so this is something that would work across all disciplines, and is fairly well established and somewhat accessible. And so the idea was to create a mentoring impact factor based upon the number of dissertation committees you've chaired and the number of dissertation committees you've served on, with the idea that if you've been on a lot of them, then you've had more impact than somebody who hasn't been on some. Again, going back to that original logic, right? It's like the citations. Only this is sort of not citations, it's actual sort of these sort of personal relationships. So what we did is we, uh, we went back and looked at uh, 40 years of uh, informational library science dissertations uh, about 2,500 dissertations, 3,500 schools that we're up to so far. We don't have them all yet, but uh, we're working on it. And we began to look at various kinds of, uh, of numbers. You know, the number of uh, committees you've chaired, the number of uh, committees you've been on. And we said, well, let's combine those. You could just do a simple sum, or you could do a prorated sum uh, using something that uh, 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 people in the past have used called fra uh, fractional productivity, in which you say, well, we're going to take 
committee chairs, and that counts as one. And if you've been on a committee of five people, that counts as one fifth. You know, simple things like that, right? And you just you know, begin to compute your impact. And so uh, we did this um, uh, for five of the, or six uh, actually, of the leading schools. And we published a paper in Library Information Science Research that came out. Um, uh, uh, last year, and we just found out it won the best um, paper in library and information science research this year. Yeah. Yeah. So this, uh, we're pretty pleased with that. Um, we've talked to University of Microfilms uh, about this. This is a whole business for them, right? Because if, if, pe if, if people, if, if Garfield built a, a multi-billion dollar, a million dollar business out of doing citation counts, then they should be able to build something uh, based on these dissertation counts. Uh, and there's lots of sort of I'm waving my hands on a whole lot of practical problems, and of course they, they sort of, oh yeah, this is really great, but we can't give you any money. And in fact, I, was, I had volunteered to even send one of our students to Ann Arbor to sit in their archive and gather this data. Oh no, they're like, you know, all tied up with, uh, we have, you know, very proprietary stuff, we can't do that. So that's fine. So we're doing it manually, mainly. The last 12 years um, are online. But you need more than 12 years. You really need to get a bigger period of time. So we've been interlibrary loaning and going to uh, the actual dissertations themselves and manually recording the advisor and the um, uh, committee members. We have a database of this. The database is uh, available online. There's the URL. Um, and it sort of looks like this. Um, and the idea here is uh, starting to gain, gain a little bit of momentum. I mean, it doesn't solve the whole problem. Uh, one of the things we did was not only to look at individuals, but we looked at cross schools. And one of the things we observed was that UNC was, of course, one of the places we did. Uh, this was the only school in which every faculty member had been on more committees than they'd been chairs. It wasn't true at any other schools. There were a lot of schools where we had one or two people who chaired a lot of committees. But, but weren't on a bunch of other committees. So they were kind of the, you know, the, the superstars, I guess, of sorts. Yeah. Uh, and then there were, but this school really has a, a very nice balance. So we sort of uh, argued that this sort of uh, suggests that we're a more collaborative faculty. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. But, you know, it seems to me that's one way to interpret this. Now, um, what we're doing now, and what Lachman Mio uh, is, is leading, is making correlations of impact factors with citation counts to see if the people who are actually the big performers with the research impact are also the big performers with the mentoring impact. And I can, just by looking at the data, I can see, you know, you look at a person like, you know, Nick Balkin, who uh, is among the most, probably the second or third most cited person in the field, and he's also very high on impact factor. Then you have other people who are very highly cited really tiny impact factors. Now, that could be because they just don't work with students, or it could be they're at a school that doesn't have a doctoral program. Or at a school that has a doctoral program, but it's very small. So this doesn't, you know, again, there's no sort of panacea here. This is just another indicator that we hope will be taken into account, along with the citation kinds of counts, to try and get a better handle on what, it, you know, what kinds of impact are we having. Um, there's a student at the University of Michigan who has uh, taken the database, with our permission of course, and is doing social network analysis. So when, uh, we, we tra uh, tracked um, uh, Jean Taig, who's uh, now deceased, but uh, was a very pr uh, productive member of the uh, uh, library science and information science world for many years, looked at her students and her students' students, and now her students' students are having their own doctoral students. And so you can start to see these sort of generational impacts that people so a lot, a lot of new possibilities here for um, uh, new work in, in this area we call impact. Uh, what we'd really like to do is do this for chemistry or another kind of scientific area and then, then start to look at, at things like interdisciplinary boundaries and whether people are ser serving across disciplines. Uh, this is very closed, right? So um, I've had complaints from some of my very senior esteemed colleagues in other places said, hey, I don't look very good here because I serve on a lot of committees in the business school or in computer science or in psychology or education or whatever. Well, sorry, you know, we have you know, all the caveat, caveats listed. This is a first sort of pass. Um, and, you know, we all do this to some degree. Uh, but if you're really cross-boundary and cross-disciplinary, you might actually start to get, have lower impact factors. I would 
suspect that if we got this for 100 disciplines, that some disciplines would be obviously more interdisciplinary because you'd see more of this cross-pollination of people across these committees. But that's a long-term kind of projection that probably will fall to some of you, perhaps, to uh, investigate in years ahead. In, in 20 years, this will all be so easy to do because all this will be online. And we'll be able to do what Sightseer and Research Index now does like that, well, not quite like that, but with, computationally, that Garfield and company did with manual uh, stuff you know, year after year after year. And so this um, um, hopefully will um, you know, be rich fodder for uh, future generations. All right, with that, I'm going to uh, stop and um, Jennifer has some uh, sure. logistics for the rest of the course.